Remember Mike Lindell, the my pillow guy who loves Trump? The guy who promoted a toxic plant extract as a miracle COVID cure and who predicted that Trump would be reinstated as president on August 13th, 2021? And who, when August 13th came and went, changed his prediction to September 30th, 2021? Paranoid prophecies are hard. So how would you explain the MyPillow guy to your kid? Well, apparently that's the situation journalist Sarah Kenzio found herself in back in 2020 when her nine-year-old son was trying to grasp his parents' political conversation. The MyPillow guy is a guy who sells pillows, but who is also working for Donald Trump to violently overthrow the government, Kenzio told him. She goes on, my son turned to my husband for a more reasonable explanation the way he did when I insisted on the existence of Santa Claus or the Tooth Fairy. But my husband shook his head and said, your mother's not messing with you, kid. Oh, my God, my son said, laughing maniacally. Oh, my God, the government. Oh, my God. Welcome to the era of conspiratorial thinking, kid. It's the dizzying subject of Kenzio's new book, which is out this week. They knew how a culture of conspiracy keeps America complacent. Sarah Kenzio got a big following by calling out Trump's authoritarianism earlier than most. Now she takes readers on a jaunty ride through the looking glass of American disinformation and the complacency it breeds. She argues that conspiracy theories are an understandable phenomenon in a country where, quote, nearly every powerful actor is lying, obfuscating or profiteering off pain. The truth may hurt, she concludes, but the lies will kill you. So how are we supposed to turn the tide and how do we hold the worst enablers of this state of affairs to account? Let's ask the author of They Knew herself, Sarah Kenzio, who is also co-host of the Gaslit Nation podcast. She joins me now. Sarah, thanks so much for coming on the show. You came to prominence, Thank you for having me. at least for many of us, talking about Trump and Mueller and Russia. I used to watch you on AM Joy very eloquently. We all know how that ended, right? Trump walked away. Is Trump ever going to face real consequences for what he does seemingly on a daily basis? Is he ever going to be prosecuted or is that just liberal fantasy? I mean, I don't know. I can't definitively tell you the future, but if you're going to speculate on the future, I think you need to be well informed on the past. I think the question we should really be asking is why was Trump not held accountable before? Why was he not held accountable during the administration when he was committing crimes openly? Why did Garland not follow up on things like the Mueller report and obstruction of dark uh, destruction of justice charges and fomenting the coup. And, you know, more importantly, why did the 40 years of criminal complicity that marked uh, Trump's rise before he even ran in 2016 uh, not lead to indictments or at least greater What's the investigation? Answer? Was the What's answer your answer to, to those very <laughs> good questions? I, I think there are a lot of things going on. Um, but I think one of the most important things is complicity uh, within the agencies of accountability um, and information, and that would include government uh, bureaus like the FBI or our officials, uh, you know, given a climate of both uh, fear and acquiescence, and also, honestly, the media. We saw how the media covered the 2015-2016 campaign. They did focus on Trump's scandals, uh, but they avoided crimes and they avoided the criminality of those immediately surrounding him, people like yeah. Paul Manafort, Steve Bannon, Michael Cohen, et cetera, who were, in fact, um, indicted. And so it's that big, broad story of transnational organized crime, big business, um, and institutional failure. Sometimes it's not complicity in a purposefully malicious sense. It's just, you know, kind of uh, yeah. rotted interiors, and um, they don't have the, the fortitude uh, to fight this off. They don't have the will. And your book uh, focuses on conspiracy, the conspiracy mindset, talk of conspiracy theory. Uh, just this week in Michigan, police shot and killed a shotgun-wielding man uh, who had fatally shot his wife and wounded his daughter. His other daughter told reporters that he had come under the sway of QAnon. Uh, we've seen supporters of QAnon attack in the Capitol. On occasion, we've seen them attack their own family members. These ridiculous theories get people killed. Like, there's nothing innocent or funny about some of the conspiracy theories that have taken hold of big chunks of America. 
Yeah, I mean, I think in these cases, if somebody is drawn to murder, particularly of their family members, I suspect that there's more going on than a vast, um, you know, internet-based uh, conspiracy, because not everyone, obviously, in QAnon is doing this. Um, you know, but I yeah. do worry that movements like this, uh, they look for individuals like that. They look for individuals who may be unstable or prone to violence, um, and who are, you know, sometimes paranoid, but also kind of hyper-vigilant, because we live in traumatic times. It doesn't matter what your political persuasion is. If you're living through a pandemic and, you know, great governmental instability and economic decline and all of these things that are hard to handle, you become psychologically more vulnerable. And I think the, the more elite operatives that participated in QAnon yeah. and, um, you know, other kind of online conspiratorial movements like that, they looked for people like that, people who would be, for example, willing to storm the Capitol um, on January 6th, they recruited and, them and lured them into the fold. And Sarah, you've studied authoritarianism in the post-Soviet republics. What are the parallels there to the flood of misinformation and conspiracy theorizing in America today? Yeah, I mean, one of the parallels I noticed early um, back in 2015 and 2016 was that the United States media and social media landscape was reminding me of what's called networked authoritarianism that you would see in countries like Azerbaijan, or at that time, Russia. Um, now it's much more closed off because they don't want folks to know about the war. They're massively losing. Um, but what they did was basically not censor the internet entirely. They would leave it open just enough so that propaganda um, and conspiracy theories and lies uh, would just, you know, overwhelm the population. But the goal being that people would just simply give up on even looking for the truth. They would think this is not a worthwhile endeavor. This is impossible. Um, you know, they would have mob attacks. And I saw all of these tactics yeah. uh, playing out here in the United States. And I think it's really a, a global phenomenon. You know, it manifests itself yes. differently in every country. Um, but I, I don't know any place that's really, you know, immune from it. It, it, it can happen anywhere. So, and I do think that the remedy good. to it, though, is, um, is honesty and transparency. Because if we had institutions that were rigorous, that were telling people the truth, that we're holding bad actors accountable, so, bad powerful actors accountable. These uh, kind of theories would not hold so much weight um, with a lot of the population. So, Sarah, you write deeply and convincingly on the dangers of our moment, on the conspiracy theories driving it. I do wonder, what would you say to your critics? Because you have your critics, like the New Republic magazine, who point to what they say are your conspiracy theories. For example, they pointed to your claim that Donald Trump was a Kremlin asset, or your suggestion in 2017 that Trump may have gotten Lindsey Graham's emails from Russia to blackmail him. I just wanted to give you a chance to respond to those criticisms. Well, the, the latter one was not actually something I said. <laughs> so I have something about the media. You know, I did think that he was compromised, and I noted that the RNC was also hacked, and that we didn't know what happened in those emails. As for the first ones, it's very funny to me to read back to 2016, 2017, when people were labeling me hysterical or an alarmist or, say, a conspiracy theorist, because everything that I said that seemed outlandish at the time came to pass, and, and it seemed outlandish. Even the Kremlin, people, no, you, you, hold, hold on, a you were right asset. about, you were right yes, about absolutely. a lot. You and I, people like, hold on, hold on, you and me were right, you and me and others were right in calling out authoritarianism, fascism before the 100%, but things like Kremlin asset, people would say that's a, yes. not a proof, there's no evidence of that. There, there's a there's a windfall of evidence. I mean, that's why he was surrounded by literal Kremlin agents. That's why Paul Manafort was running his campaign. That's why he was immersed, um, you know, with the Russian mafia, um, you know, with Semyon Moldovich's operation. I think what people think is that Kremlin asset means that Trump was a spy, that he was some sort of, you know, super espionage agent. And that's not what I'm saying at all. I'm saying he is somebody who is influenced by the Kremlin. And, you know, Trump made this abundantly clear back in 2016 when he was asking Russia to give him Hillary Clinton's emails at a press conference. Yeah. Like, none of this was really hidden. It was in the public uh, domain. And I think there's just some confusion okay. about terminology and what exactly that means. OK, one last question before I let you go. We're about to talk about COVID. One of the things that drove your book were the conspiracy theories around COVID. You finished writing in the pandemic and you write, quote, COVID revealed actual conspiracies by malicious actors, spurred conspiracy theories by a frightened population bereft of reliable data and was weaponized by propagandists seeking to use conspiracy theories uh, to annihilate compassion. How do we break through that? We're still losing hundreds of people every day, some of them because of conspiracy theories. Yeah, I think it's very difficult. I think the CDC 
has let us down. And a lot of quote unquote public health experts who actually don't have a background in epidemiology are letting the American people down. And I can't really blame folks for being, um, you know, skeptical or frightened about uh, the vaccines, for being confused about what they're supposed to do uh, in order to not get COVID, because there's there have been so many conflicting messages and conflicting policies. And it's really a tragedy. And so my, my main hope for that is just that yes. people don't lose their sense of empathy, that they don't, you know, laugh or jeer when people die, that they have each other's backs. Like well if, if we could get back to that place, that's what I... I would strive for.